Good morning. Welcome to episode 52 of the Driller Newscast, a weekly update on the news and events that are impacting the drilling and groundwater industry. I'm your host, Brock Yorty. This week, we have a great episode with Executive Director of the National Groundwater Association, Terry Morse. He'll talk about what the board's up to and the new initiatives by the National Groundwater Association. Our featured industry professional that'll close out our show this week is Nakona Williams of Venture Drilling Supply. She'll talk about her experiences in the industry and what she loves about it. But before we get into this great episode, let's talk some safety. For this week's safety topic, I want to talk about the right tool for the right job. And I know we're an industry where the solution is always a bigger hammer and everything's a hammer. Therefore, what happens? We get a lot of hand, eye, get a lot of injuries from using the improper tool. So I want you to start to think about the tools you have on the job site and how we use them properly and how we use them improperly from splicing wires to a pump. Are we using the right wire strippers? Are we using that Stanley knife or razor? Do we have cut level four gloves on? The only way we can mitigate risk is by the proper processes, the right tool, and training our people with the knowledge that they need in order to be successful on the job site. So let's do a quick assessment of that supply truck, that pump hoist, that rig support tender, that rig. Once you start looking at the tools, of course, we have modified tools. We have things that we have welded. We have things that we use because we like them from how we untighten the pitless to be able to pull that pump. What does that look like? My family always called it the cane. Okay. So now that we're looking at these tools, start thinking about the near misses. And I want you to really start thinking about those times that we have scraped ourselves, busted a fingernail, something that wasn't really first aid necessary, but still hurt us and said, man, how did I let myself do that again? What was our process? What is our standard operating procedure? Were we wearing the right personal protective equipment? Training processes, the right tool should supersede our last line of defense of personal protective equipment. So let's make sure we have the right gloves. We have the right guards, everything necessary. If we're going to be welding or grinding, what do we have for chaps or that shield? All of these components. Let's go back over those and think about, am I using the right tool or am I using the tool that I have right now? And how is that going to impact us as the day goes on? Go out and be safe. For this week in the news, we're going to catch up with the National Groundwater Association Board, what exciting things are happening in the first quarter, and what we can see for the rest of the year. I welcome Terry Morris, Executive Director of the NGWA. Welcome, Terry. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. How the heck did you get into the drilling groundwater industry wow um i'll I'll say you know you can say it was coincidental fate you know meant to be um as you know my background is not drilling i'm not a driller um my background is association management insurance risk management sales marketing so it just happened to be I, I came across when NGWA was doing the executive search and I read the description of the type of individual that they were looking to hire, the type of background, and it fit mine, I mean, to a T. So I applied and it, it worked out. So, you know, the way it, it came across, and I think the reason why the board hired me, our members have the have the expertise. They didn't need another driller coming in. They didn't need a scientist or engineer. That's what our volunteers, they're the experts. They needed someone that could lead the organization from a business standpoint, um, manage it like a business and have the vision moving forward and work with the board. And that's kind of what I bring to the table. So I, I've been fortunate enough to have been blessed with an awesome board and an incredible group of volunteers across all sections. And that stuff kind of funnels up and we work together and hopefully we're taking this, which I feel we are taking this association in the right direction. That's such an astute way to put it, you know, as, as drilling to uh, the completion of a well, to 
the engineering regulations. We have so many pieces that are moving that we talk a lot about business or we talk a lot about marketing or vision. And sometimes in the middle of doing, we don't have time. And so of course it makes sense to bring in an expert in that aspect (laughs) to help, you know, point us in the right direction as there's so much going on. Well, you know, a a lot of our, our board members and members, I mean, they, they're business owners, operators and, and they're successful. So they know how to run a business. The association world's a different type of business. So you have to do lobbying. You've got education. We produce three print magazines. Um, We put on education. We put on a trade show and then a staff to manage. So it's really association management. If I add it up, it's probably six or seven different business models. And and that doesn't line up to a, a driller business model. It's, it's it's a different world, so it's a different it's a different business to run. And when you can marry the association management world with a group of board members who know in theory how to run businesses, then it's perfect. It's a perfect match to move everything forward. That's great. Speaking of uh, these great businessmen and women, and uh, what's going on? What is our board up to? What exciting things have they gotten into already in the first? You know, yeah, it's three months. Well, you know, their job is to have that 10,000 foot level, that viewpoint. And at one of our mid-year meetings, I'll grab something here, um, a little prop. You know, they all had helicopters uh, given to them. And, it, and that was a reminder. And like, I've got it on my desk here after five years. I know some of them still talk about it. Their role is to have that 10,000 foot viewpoint. They're not supposed to come down to the streets and, and get into the weeds. That's That's my job to take what the vision they see. Then I take it down to the street level and put it in play. So um, to say this year, it's really been a vision for the past five years. And we had, you know, we were better together, but we we changed that to focus on the future. So a lot of things that we're doing, we're trying to look down the road, the board looking down the road, sort of uh, had an analogy, a, a gentleman I used to work for, he'd always ask, hey, any pebbles falling? Because if there's a pebble falling on your head, you better look it up because there's a boulder coming soon. So, you know, these meetings are all about what what are the pebbles out there? And um, one of the ones that we started a few years back is a partnership with Oklahoma State University because our certification program in education was kind of archaic, still, you know, textbook rating. And we thought we need to bring this up to the times and digitize it and put it online and deliver it the way the youth and individuals like education deliver nowadays. So they've been helping us. with that prospect. So it's, it's contractor education, trying to take it to the next level and just not here in the United States. It's, it's global. I mean, the, the plans for this education program, uh, we're going to put it in different languages. So right now it's English and being worked on in Spanish, but it's, it's where we can train drillers across the globe, just not here in the United States. So that's one, um, you know, we have our 75 year anniversary this year. And, um, one thing I, I don't want to show you is I'm getting up here. We have, um, and I had this in one of our meetings, uh, this book written a few years ago. If I get it online there, right? Uh, first 50 years. And there's a couple of pages in here, and it talks about the contractors needing to understand that um, they run a valuable business, provide a valuable service, just like doctors and attorneys. It's one of life's basics need. They're delivered to help and deliver water to individuals and communities. And they need to be paid accordingly and, and don't operate like the Walmarts down the street. You, you should get paid a fair wage for the product you're, you're providing. And uh, I can't announce it yet, but I think we have an industry changing product coming here later this year that's going to help the contractors manage and operate their business successfully. Not that they're not doing it already, but this is going to help them be more efficient and um, improve the bottom line. And then also we're going to educate maybe some contractors who aren't experts in that field to come along. And um, so I think after 75 years, we're going to deliver something to the industry that's been needed for a long time. Um, Foundation wise, looking at, you know, trying to educate the youth. I came here five years ago because you asked me how I got involved in this. And I remember uh, talking to my staff and I said, look, I grew up on a well, so I, I understand well water. 
but a majority of the people out there, 98%, 99.5% of the general public, they don't know where the water comes from. When you say groundwater, it kind of sounds dirty. People don't understand groundwater. And I have a pretty tenured staff. They're, they're people have been here 25. Kathy just retired. Kathy Butcher, some of you know her, you know, after nearly 50 years in the industry. Um, staff with 35 years, 30. And they all know the industry. But I said, but I'm coming to you from the outside. I'm telling you, people don't know. And we need to start shouting from the rooftops, explain to them where this water comes from. Well, about three, four months later, a gentleman came off. office and over here on the wall, I've got an aquifer map. And he's he's about he was in his mid 60s. He looks at the map and looks back at me and says, "Groundwater. I get it. What's under the ground?" And I go, "Bingo!" And you just confirmed what I've been trying to tell my staff. So our message and our strategy for the past five years moving forward is to educate the general public on what this industry does and where their water comes from and what's the proper way to manage it and maintain it for future generations. So one of the programs are, that our board focused on. It's our youth education STEM program, the awesome aquifer kit. And again, partnership with um, Oklahoma State, we digitize that. And if you want to say one thing that came, it was a good thing came from COVID, was we have these physical kits that kids hands-on learn the whole cycle of water. But then during COVID, we had supply chain issues, couldn't get all the supplies. So I'm speaking with OSU and I asked, I said, hey, we've got this kit. And we digitize it because if we can digitize it, then we can put it into schools much quicker. And my contact there is Caitlin, Dr. Caitlin Barnes. She said, well, we can we can digitize anything about the size of a rabbit or smaller. I go, guess what? This thing's about the size of a rabbit. So I sent it to her. And from that, you know, Awesome Aqua 360 was born. So now we have the virtual classroom model that we marry together with the physical kits. This past year, we kicked it off school year. Um, August 22, right now 23, so school year 22, 23, we thought, you know, if we could get 50, 60 classrooms, so far we've done over 235 classrooms across the country. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's an average of 23 students per classroom. That's over 5,000 students that have gone through our, our program. And um, the sky's the limit on this. We could do 400 classrooms. It's, it's just a matter of how much money we can raise to fund it. Um, and this this program targets students, I'll say it's ideal for grades five through eight, but we have programs already written that we have high school programs. They're going to be completely digital. So we're going to be able to educate kids um, A through 12 on the cycle of water. And hopefully two things come from it. One, they just, worst case, they learn where the water comes from and how to how to properly manage it for generations to come. Second thing is it's to let them know that there's a great industry out here. There's there's career paths, whether you want to go down the path to be a driller or you want to go and it's not a college degree. If you like more trade, there you go. But if you want to do something more um, professional training, go to college, well, then you can you can go the scientists and engineering side, hydrogeologists, whatever it be. And, and that's the connection to OSU because they're. They're the world premiere on you know, their geology school. So, um, so there's a strategy behind this. It's to educate the youth, but also perpetuation in the industry, make everybody aware of it. So those are some of the, the great things we've got, you know, envision and working on. And, uh, and we have one more, <laughs> actually two more. You got me on, on a roll here. Um, we want to educate the, the the general public in the industry on geothermal technology. You know, it's a big thing with the, you know, the green um, wokeness and, and crave out there, but there is so much business to be had now in geothermal. There's not enough drillers. So the building we have here at NGWA, <clears throat> um, it's about 30, 40 years old. We have nine air conditioning units, four furnaces. <laughs> Some of those need replaced right now. And um, just off a whim, I mentioned something to um, IGSBA, the members. I said, what, what do you think about retrofitting our building? And I said, we could use it as a case study and invite politicians to come and see and public policy officials understand what geothermal is all about. And they grabbed onto it. So we're in the beginning stages of working through a plan to retrofit our building geothermal 
and to build a case study out of it and record it so we can educate the youth, put it back towards that education program, what, what geothermal is all about. Um, you just to educate the contractors in the industry about, hey, here's here's another business avenue you can you can get into, and then also the public, so other business can can do it. And if it works out the way I think it's going to work out, uh, this will be a showcase, like a showcase home. People can come here and visit and look at the pumps and understand the whole technology and how the building's done. and And it's going to be made possible because of our partnership with IGSBA and their members who are working, um, you know, their competitors, but they understand the value that this proposition, this uh, project can bring to the industry. And they're working together uh, as a team to all come in and retrofit this building and showcase it to the world. And that's, it's, it's very uh, poignant, you know, the geothermal boom right now. And uh, really every bit of bandwidth we have right now with the NGWA membership could put one rig in New York and we still couldn't hit the goals. Yeah, it, isn't it amazing? <clears throat> right. And, you know, in, in the past, um, you know, I could see you know, a few years ago when the first craze, you had to crunch the numbers, was it worth the time, money? Um, but I think it's here to stay. And there, there's a demand out there. And, and I think by us participating and using our building as an example, that um, the goal and objective is, is to show the general public and the politicians and contractors, everybody, this is what can be done. This is the, how it's beneficial, long-term approach. So we got a lot of big players in geothermal out there. Uh, yeah, how are you yeah. going to get everybody's technology in one building? Uh, well, so uh, part of it. I just threw Terry a curveball. I know, away, I know, I know. And I, I, um, there, there are all the players are working together right now, so I can't definitively say who's going to do what, but um our building here, there's three floors. So each floor might be dedicated to one or two partners, if that makes any sense. So um, the third floor might be a certain company's pump and products, and then the second floor, and it kind of all blended together, working together. But that's kind of the the thought on paper right now. It's, it's important. I, I think it's a great concept that... Uh all of these different companies that yes, can be adversarial or competitors, or, you know, we're such a small section of the air source heat, the rest of the HVAC universe, no different than the driller magazine and the groundwater journal, you know, we are right. just two pieces and a massive, you know, community of things going on and our voices together, us collaborating together makes everything stronger and yeah. better. Exactly. I think everybody sees there's a greater picture here um, uh, and a bigger objective to accomplish. And it, instead of fighting, it's better to work together, you know. Thanks for that update, Terry. We will see Terry again next week, which will lead into the National Groundwater Association fly-in, which I'll be joining them for our featured industry professional and woman in the industry. It's Nakona Williams, a good friend to the industry and the driller magazine and all around individual that can connect people, tell great stories and inspire the next generation. I hope you enjoy. So I didn't necessarily choose the industry at first. I was born into it. So, I mean, that's, that's exactly how I got into it. My dad started drilling back in the seventies and then he started the supply company in the eighties, early eighties, right before I was born. So yeah, I'm an eighties baby too. Um, and then, so he and my mom worked alongside each other and for years and years and years started the supply company. We got, a, you know, a couple of, um, deals, uh, with different distributor with different manufacturers. We were a big Ingersoll Rand dealer back then. And, um, we still followed that same chain from Ingersoll to Atlas to Epiroc now. But um, when my dad passed in 94, my mom took over. So um, just seeing a woman in the industry just thrive and, you know, overcome all of these obstacles that sometimes men don't face, just, you know, getting shut down by banks and things like that. And she just persevered. And there were a lot of guys um, on the team who helped her get through that. So that was really great. And um, I went off to college, got a degree in advertising, did not think I would be in the drilling industry. I thought I would be 
in some huge agency out in um, San Francisco, maybe Dallas, like my friends. And um, I ended up coming back to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, where we were founded and started doing advertising for print back when the print um, publications were king. They were being sent out all the time. People kept them in their trucks and read them like they were Bibles whenever they needed to look for classifieds or anything like that. Remember those days? So anyways, uh, so I did that. I did all of our IT, still kind of handle that. All of our software systems, you know, everyone comes to me for every little thing. Hey, my printer's not working. I work on that too. Um, we started usedrigs.com, which has been great. Started that with my husband, Tyler, who I met during college. And he started working with us a year after we got married. And um, just alongside him, it's been great. Uh, we bounce ideas off each other. I mean, you and your wife are kind of, you guys are in the same industry-ish and you get to bounce ideas off each other. That's that's just like a really fun thing to do. Not everybody gets to continue discussing excitedly about what happens, you know, in their industry after five o'clock. So um, that's how I ended up here. And now I work with my older brother, Colt. We have Venture Drilling Supply and we have four different locations and we may be expanding or not. Who knows? You might see us somewhere else someday. That's kind of kind of how I got into it. It's I love the fact that you brought your partner into it. Uh, had he had any drilling knowledge before you? No. Drove? No, no, no. He's just some uh, Texas boy who uh, fell in love with an Oklahoma girl and fell in love with uh, the industry. He actually started doing like foundation stuff. We were um, we were doing that back then. And then he transitioned into water well. And that's the rest was history. He loves the industry so much, loves his customers. He's in sales. He was kind of born to do that. Um, and he just he just loves, loves, loves the industry. What excites you today about the industry? Well, okay, so it's it's kind of like that double-edged sword with what excites you is also the challenge. And so what excites, it's, excites me is the ever-changing um, component of the industry, but that's also a challenge, you know, with regulations and laws and things like that that are just popping up because of the state of the industry as things progress. But um, that's also exciting, um, new technology, new methods to drill. It's always exciting when you see um, someone drilling here that has their best practice and they share it with someone who's drilling over here that might be struggling. And then they adopt their practice and it's just, it's like a world of difference. They just, everybody loves to help each other out. And that's what I think that's what is so great about this industry and what it excites me is that um, people are willing to work together and even more so now than ever, as we're connected um, on a, you know, a, an up-to-date real-time um, basis, everyone can just reach out. You're just a phone call away or just a, just a post away from getting all the information you need. And it's just an exciting time in this industry as it transitions from being traditional to maybe like this new generation coming in and and changing things up and getting together and instead of um, being just competitors. That's beautiful. You know, you said earlier about working with the print and whatnot, and everybody loved that on the seat of their truck. And we get that question a lot at the driller, you know, I can't believe you did this. And ironically, it's, uh, I go, okay, so you want to share this information with your buddy in the next county or the next state or something. Are you going to take a photo and text them a photo of it? Or are you going yeah. to send them the link, you know, and with social media and all the ways we can communicate right now, that's really the, the evolution. It's print didn't die. It evolved into, I can now have every magazine on my phone. Yeah. You know, and the helper didn't put his grubby, greasy, dope ridden hands all over it. Well, he's and it's not outdated. It. It's it's real time. Absolutely. Tell me about the background. You got a rig in what looks like a, a grape orchard. Yeah, it's actually in Napa. It's an orchard in Napa. I can't or recall vineyard. exactly I mean, which be. vineyard, but this is um, Don Huckfelt's rig. This is, I believe that might be his seventh. TH60. His dad was a driller too. He's one of my favorite characters in the industry. 
Uh, he actually uh, has a passion for wine. He has produced his own wine. He actually sent me a bottle. I haven't opened it yet, but it's a 2013 cab. And I'm really, really excited to pop that open on a special occasion. Um, but that's that's him. That's uh, Tyler went out there to visit him and he flew his drone up there and took some pictures and he sent it to the uh, vineyard owner too. And that guy, he was so excited to get those pictures. So um, it's really neat to see the the things that you don't realize that are behind the products that you love like where where did where are we getting the water that grows these grapes you know things like that it's just really cool there's water is involved in literally everything i say one of the reasons i'm in the water industry is because wine and beer is 98 percent water so we better have good clean water to do this with yeah yeah for sure it's got to taste good right the water needs to be good I uh, I love what you just said about characters. Uh, our industry is just full of individuals, full of life characters, but we're really good with our hands and we're just not so good at using our hands to write things down. Do you have any other favorite characters? Um, they, Now, they're not necessarily characters. I mean, they are characters if you get to know them, but there was a uh, there was a father son duo um, in Adel, Georgia that um, they bought a used rig. Well, the father, Joel, uh, bought the rig for his son behind his back using me. Like I had this listed and it was a Versa drill, a V140. And this this kid that, that has been drilling with his dad, Kyle had been drilling with his dad forever, had wanted this drill for 10 years. So, I mean, that he grew up drilling with his dad and he's got two little boys who are around the, the drills all the time with him too. So that's gonna be, third generation easy. I mean, not easy, but you know, it's definitely gonna happen. So, uh, Joel got a hold of me and, um, went to, he didn't even get to go see the rig. It was during COVID. So there were all these restrictions. He didn't get to see it. He said, I want it. Let's just go ahead and put a deposit down. I trust the uh, previous owner took care of it. And I trust that you are selling me a good rig. And his son, Kyle kept texting me, Hey, is it still available? Please tell me it's still available. Like every day, so for two weeks, when it was in the process of, you know, them getting funded and paying and then getting it shipped out there, he, he had to lie to his son. He told me, hey, lie to my son if he asks you any questions. And I said, I'm not going to lie to him, but I will, you know, keep him on the hook and and leave him hanging. So uh, he gets it and he's so excited. He gets to, you know, the big red bow on it, gets to surprise his son with it. And it, I get a text from his son later, like, you were so wrong for going along with my dad and, and tricking me. But in the end, I'm super, super happy. Sent me all kinds of pictures with their whole family on the rig. I just I just love that there are still those um, family companies that are passing this down to, to their kids and their grandkids and their th three generations right there on the rig still going. It's, uh yeah it's tough because there's so many industries out there now and the investment into the equipment, especially from going and getting secondary education, but equipment is an investment and that's an investment in your family's longevity in life. I remember our first rotary rig we got was used. Yeah. And you probably, you probably knew everything about that rig right after you got to start working on it. It's your baby. I definitely knew uh, its limitations and also, <laughs> uh, yeah, dad, uh, we just used a bigger hammer on that, but we can hammer it back out. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Advice for the next generation coming in um, for ladies, what would you say to some young women right now that are maybe thinking about advertising? Matter of fact, uh, Rachel, our featured driller, said she was sitting in high school in fashion class and they had to go watch this college recruiter. And one of the things they talked about was Fleming College blasting and drilling. And she's like, I think I want to be a blasting and drilling person. And everybody else in her class was like, we're doing fashion, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would have said the same thing, uh, say to her, like, no, 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 we're going to do fashion instead. But uh, it only takes one person to get out there and take that risk. And then um, the other women that, you know, I don't know that I necessarily have that much advice for someone wanting to get in it besides just go for it because it's really great and everyone's really accepting. I don't, I mean, 
there's a small handful of women and we all love each other and we all get along so great. And when we're around each other, it's just like we're family. So um, it is a smaller community of women in the drilling industry, but we all support each other and we lift each other up. So that is, it's not competitive with women. I mean, yeah, of course you're working for different companies, but it doesn't get heated or catty or anything like that, like the fashion industry would. That's a great point. And it's a, we are about 95% men in, in construction in general, yeah. you know? And so it's just drilled down. Last question. I, uh, I follow social media and Facebook and whatnot. And you are like one of those individuals that always knows somebody that can get something done. How do you do yeah. it? Like something gets posted online and you're like, oh, I can help you with that. Oh, I know somebody. I got a guy. I got a gal. How do you do it? Uh, that's just, it's just one of my favorite things is just to be connected with all different types of people. I'm one of those people who has my hand in a lot of different things. You know, it's, it could be ADD. It could be whatever, you know, it's just always want to be doing something different, but it, it, it's also beneficial because you meet so many different people in different industries and you've always got a contact to reach out to. And I'm not afraid to email the CEO of a company requesting a part that maybe they, uh, you know, haven't made in 10 years asking them for the design so that we could take it somewhere else. You never know what they're going to say unless you ask. And that's, you know, that's one of the, the, I mean, that's what you, that's how you have to do be if you do want to solve problems. I mean, you just have to go for it. And th that is one of my favorite things to do when someone messages and they say, I can't find this part, or I really need this drill rig. And Tyler and I, we get to think and we brainstorm, we reach out to different people, we make five or six calls and, you know, someone knows something and we just follow that lead. And, and usually we end up finding a good solution for that person, but you, you can't be afraid to pick up that phone. You know, everyone's all about texting, messaging. Yeah, you can do that. But, you know, it's, it's nice to get someone on the phone to talk to where you can, you know, hear the, the cadence of their voice and their intention and things like that, feel how genuine they are. So I've, we like phone calls. We like to talk on the phone and that's how things get done. I love it. I, I say often, you know, we're an incredibly small industry, but because of that, we're very interconnected. Like it's uh, it's very easy to recognize a rig on the West coast or the East coast and go, Oh, I, I've had a beer with them at yeah. the engine. And it's, I love it. It's fun. Yeah. You've got a little connection with everybody. It's really cool. And if you don't, have one in the past, it's easy to make a connection. There's always something to talk about. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's, I know you're very busy, but I wanted your perspective and it was everything we could have expected. <laughs> well, hopefully, um, you know, having me and having Rachel on will uh, entice some other ladies to come on and share some of their stories. Cause I personally love to hear uh, about other women in the industry. I'd love to see your wife on here. Well, funny you say that with your mention. I think I'm just going to make her come on next. Yay, that's so exciting. I can't wait to watch the episode. I am going to just put her right on the spot. No questions. I may just start asking her drilling terminology and yes. see how she answers it. Uh, I, it will be entertaining, if nothing else. She always is. <laughs> Thank you again, Dakota. All right. Thanks, Brock. Thank you for joining us for episode 52 of the Driller Newscast. Please check out thedriller.com for all the great new content. Thank you to NGWA Terry Morris for coming on. Again, we'll see him next week to talk about the fly-in as we're preparing to meet with Congress and have great discussions about water legislation, clean energy, clean air, protecting our environment. And a huge thank you to Nakona Williams and you couldn't have said it better about just become part of this industry and enjoy it because we're a lot of fun. And it, once it's in to your blood, you just can't get out. Have a great week.